Chapter 41 A Higher Octave There was a huge tuning fork in the center of the monastery's courtyard, an altar for outdoor worship when the weather was kind. Now, at slightly before eight in the morning, it was struck repeatedly and rapidly until the tone it yielded resonated within the bones of everyone in the compound. It didn't matter anymore whether it was deemed A-flat or G-sharp. Everyone knew it was an alarm. Secretly, the members of the Tallahassee Tonal Monastic Order had hoped to avoid the wrath of the Scythum. They were not a sibilant sect. They were peaceful and kept to themselves. But Overblade Goddard did not distinguish between the sibilant and the serene. Scythes broke through the gate, in spite of the fact that it had been reinforced against them and flooded the grounds. They wasted no time. Scythes are not the problem, but the symptom, their curate had told them in the chapel the night before. What comes cannot be avoided, and if they come for us, we must not cower. In showing our courage, it will reveal their cowardice. There was a total of eleven scythes that morning, a number deeply unpleasant to tonists, for it was one short of a twelve-note chromatic scale. Whether this was intentional or coincidence, they didn't know. Although, most tonists did not believe in coincidence. The scythe's robes were flashes of color within the earth tones of the monastery. Blues and greens, bright yellows and vermilion, in each one was speckled with gems that glittered like stars in an alien sky. None of the scythe's were celebrated ones. But perhaps they hoped, through this gleaning, to gain renown. Each had their own method of killing, but all were skilled and efficient. More than 150 tonists were gleaned in the monastery that morning, and although immunity was promised to their immediate families, Scythe policy had changed. When it came to immunity, the North American allied Scythe had adopted an opt-in paradigm. If you were owed immunity, you'd have to approach the office of the Scythe and request it. When the Scythe's business was done, the few tonists who had not had the conviction to stand in defiance came out of hiding. Fifteen. Another number that was unpleasing to the tone. Their penance would be to collect the dead, all the while knowing that their bodies should be among them. But as it turned out, the tone, toll, and thunder had a plan for them too. Before they could even count their dead, several trucks showed up at their gate, an elder Tonus stepped out of the monastery to greet them. He was reluctant to be a voice of leadership, but he had little choice among the circumstances. Yeah, we got an order to assist him to pick up some perishables, one of the drivers told him. You must be mistaken, the elder Tonus said. There's nothing here, nothing but death. At the mention of death, the trucker became uncomfortable, but stuck to his orders and showed his tablet. Right here, see? Order was placed half an hour ago, directly from the Thunderhead, high priority. I'd ask it what the order was for, but, you know, as well as I do that, it ain't got an answer. The tonist was baffled until he took a second look at the trucks and realized they all had refrigeration units. He took a deep breath and decided not to question. Tonists always burn their dead, but the toll had told them not to, and the Thunderhead sent these vehicles. All that remained was for the survivors to be moved by the spirit of the tone and prepare the dead for this unconventional journey to the higher octave. Because the trucks had come, and they most certainly could not be avoided. Curate Mendoza was a practical man. He saw big pictures that few saw and knew how to play the world, stroking it and gently turning its attention toward whatever he wanted it to see. Attention. That's all it really was. Caressing people just enough to make them focus in on something specific within the vast visual field of their lives. Whether it was a blue polar bear's or a young man clothed in purple and silver, what he had accomplished with Grayson Tolliver was remarkable. Mendoza had come to believe that this was his purpose, that perhaps the tone in which he truly believed on good days had set him in Grayson's path in order to transform him into a conduit for its will. What Mendoza had done for Tonism would have earned him canonization in mortal religions. <laughs> religions. Instead, it had left him excommunicated. He was back to being a lowly and humble Tonist, 
riding trains in sackcloth, with people turning away rather than acknowledging his existence. He had considered going back to his monastery in Kansas, returning to the simple life he had known for many years, but leaving behind the taste of power he had had these last few years was hard to do. Grayson Tolliver was no prophet. Tonus needed Mendoza now much more than they needed the boy. Mendoza would find a way to heal the wounds in his own reputation, repair the damage, and create a new spin. For if there was anything he knew how to do, it was create a spin. Hey friends, narrator here. So, that completes part four. Next up, part five, and also the conclusion of the book as a whole. Part five is called Vessels, and I'm eager to explore it with you. What we see here in chapter 41, A Higher Octave, is Goddard's plan or his influence coming to fruition for this little Tallahassee monastery, an immediate gleaning of 150 tonists. But on the flip side, we also see the Thunderhead's plan of action to counteract whatever it is Goddard has in store with the showing up of refrigeration trucks. I don't know where the dead are going, but the toll, the thunder, has a plan for it. And finally, Curate Mendoza. The whole section ends on his words. I'm really curious what spin he's going to throw on it. Thanks for listening. See you in the next one.